Um, so the way I'm going to approach this for the next few minutes um, is to take as a kind of background assumption um, that the landscapes which are produced by logistics um, are terrifically significant uh, in relationship to climate change. That is that they are both um, as kind of uh, part of the material metabolism of urbanization or the conduit for that metabolism, um, significant in terms of producing the emissions that generate climate change, um, as well as um, because of their kind of um, position, as Alex was saying, uh, frequently in these uh, vulnerable locations like former wetlands, uh, significantly threatened by um, climate change. So the question that I'm going to try to answer, or at least suggest some possible answers to very quickly is, um, how exactly is it that logistics generates landscapes? Um, and how might design find opportunities to um, enter into that work or to uh, maybe perhaps hack it a little bit? Um, so in order to do that, um, what I'm going to start by talking about uh, is the expansion of the Panama Canal because I think uh, the expansion of the Panama Canal suggests a few key aspects um, of how it is that logistics um, as a discipline and as a spatial practice uh, goes about making and disassembling and remaking landscapes. Um, so this is a project that started in 2007 um, and is continuing Right now, they're expecting to complete in 2016, although a few years ago, they were expecting to finish in 2014. Um, so the first uh, kind of characteristic of this mega project um, that I think is useful for understanding logistics is scale. So the, the fact that um, logistics makes landscapes on an enormous scale. Um, and when we look at the extent uh, of the Panama Canal expansion, um, kind of its spatial extent, um, it, of course, stretches from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Um, and as it does that, uh, it involves the deepening and widening of channels. Um, it involves the construction of a pair um, of sets of enormous locks on both the Atlantic and the Pacific. Um, it involves uh, raising, actually, the uh, water level of this enormous lake, Lake Gatun, by a foot and a half. Um, and all of that involves an enormous amount of earth moving, um, so uh, about uh, I think 173 million cubic uh, yards of earth being moved during the Panama Canal expansion, uh, at least projected. Um, that's two-thirds of the volume that was involved in the original construction of the canal. Um, it's uh, about 10 times the volume that was excavated uh, for the big dig in Boston. Um, it's more than was excavated for the construction of the Suez Canal. It's more than was excavated for the construction of the Three Gorges Dam in China. It's just an absolutely enormous uh, kind of volume of earth being moved. Um, and this movement um, is in response to um, a set of um, very discrete changes uh, within kind of the logistical playing field, the global logistical playing field. Um, in particular, uh, it's the erosion of some of the competitive advantages that the Panama Canal has enjoyed over two alternative routes, one being the Suez Canal um, and the other being uh, the U.S. intermodal system. All of these are routes uh, that describe primarily trade between East Asia um, and the Atlantic Ocean. Um, this erosion um, has happened in the context um, of a kind of extreme acceleration of global commerce, um, particularly in recent decades. Um, and this erosion, or sorry, this acceleration has bumped up against um, some physical bottlenecks. Uh, within the Panama Canal. In particular, um, the kind of uh, specification uh, of the Panama Canal's locks, they're like the physical width and depth of the Panama Canal's locks, um, which for a long time uh, set kind of the dimensions of the largest ships that sailed um, on the ocean. So these were ships that were known as Panamax. Uh, it meant uh, a Panamax ship would be the very largest ship that could fit through the locks of the Panama Canal. Um, but towards the latter half of the 20th century, the Panamax specification um, started to obsolesce in favor of the post-Panamax specification, which would just generally mean any ship which was too large to transit the Panama Canal. Um, and of course, as ships that were too large became prevalent, um, this resulted in a shift of traffic away from the Panama Canal towards those two other systems that I mentioned, the U.S. intermodal system, the Suez Canal. 
Um, and so the, the Panama Canal expansion is a response to this, an attempt to reclaim some of this global share, a kind of global share of maritime commerce uh, for the Panama Canal, um, and would result in the creation of a new specification um, called the new Panamax. Um, I think uh, one of the useful things uh, about this specification, uh, or to recognize about this specification, is that um, specific specifications have a kind of efficacy across scale, have the capacity um, to actually reorganize landscapes. So like the, the Panamax originally and now the new Panamax uh, actually operates as a kind of boring tunnel, a kind of um, specification that cuts through physical earth, it cuts through infrastructures, it cuts through ecologies and reorganizes landscape on a very large scale. Um, so at first that's the scale of the isthmus, um, but that's also beyond the scale of the isthmus, that's actually this kind of engineering shockwave which is reverberating um, throughout the Americas, both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts of North and South America. Um, and when we zoom in and look at North America specifically, um, and the Atlantic and Gulf coasts in particular, um, this engineering shockwave takes on the form um, of dredging, so the deepening of navigation channels. Um, it takes on the form of new land being constructed with the surplus sediment from that dredging. Um, it includes the upgrading of port facilities to accommodate post-Panamax ships. Um, and it includes the expansion of intermodal facilities or the connections between ports and the wider world to accommodate increased flows. Um, one example, one kind of early example actually um, of this shockwave is the work that's been done in New York Harbor um, to prepare for post-Panamax shipping. Um, and this is kind of typically uh, or uh, representatively taken the form of infrastructural upgrades to the port, um, the accommodation of the, the larger air draft of post-Panamax vessels, which necessitates raising bridges, um, and in particular, dredging. So lots and lots of dredging, um, which I think is a particularly instructive among these, um, these different characteristics uh, because uh, of the way that it has been um, utilized uh, or the way that it has provided an opportunity to utilize a kind of excess thrown off um, by this making of landscapes by logistics. Um, so if we look at the material geography of dredging in New York Harbor, um, in, uh, in this case between 2009 and 2012, um, the vast majority of the kind of movement from dredge sites to dredge disposal sites uh, does not result from maintenance dredging, which is what's shown here. Maintenance dredging would be uh, all the dredging that's required to maintain current channel depths, um, but most of it actually results from expansion dredging, um, which would be the dredging that's accomplished to go from the current depth, 45 feet, down to 50 feet, the depth specified by post-Panamax ships or new Panamax ships. Um, so there's a, there's a quantitative difference there between expansion dredging and maintenance dredging. There's also a qualitative difference. Um, so the, the dredge material involved in maintenance dredging is typically highly contaminated. It's actually spilled out of these places like the Meadowlands industrial complexes. Um, it's traditionally put in places like the mud dump site, which is this enormous underwater mountain of dredge in the New York Bight, which many of you have probably never heard of. Um, uh, but now that there's this expansion dredging also happening, there's suddenly an enormous volume um, of kind of clean virgin sediment, in particular sand, uh, that is uh, kind of carved out of undisturbed um, harbor bottom. Um, and this clean sand provides the opportunity uh, to engage in kind of sedimentary restoration. So um, Ted very helpfully um, covered the kind of catastrophic decline of marsh islands in Jamaica Bay. Um, uh, as he said, uh, kind of, I think it was like 50% um, of the total land area of Jamaica Bay's marsh islands was lost um, in the 20th century and it was projected that actually the rest of it would vanish within a few decades at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, but because of uh, this opportunity generated by the Panama Canal because of this fresh clean sand that was suddenly available to the Army Corps that needed disposal somewhere, uh, there was this opportunity to link um, that kind of sedimentary excess 
to the deficit that was occurring in Jamaica Bay. Um, and this has led to kind of a large scale program of marsh restoration, uh, where through the kind of brute force application of sand, um, they've been able to reverse the process of entropy. Um, so I think the interesting question that that raises is like, who would have predicted this? Who would have predicted that the same forces that generated the expansion of the Panama Canal um, would also lead to the opportunity to restore marsh islands in Jamaica Bay? Um, and I think that kind of question, like seriously, who would have predicted this, um, suggests something about the limits of logistics as a positivistic discipline. Um, if we go back to uh, the original excavation of the Panama Canal, so early 20th century, um, when the United States took over from France in excavating the Panama Canal um, and started to cut through um, this portion known as Culebra, um, one of the things that they found uh, was that, um, as David McCullough describes in this quote, kind of the deeper the cut through Culebra was dug, the worse the slides were. Um, being landslides, and so the more slopes had to be carved back. Uh, the more digging done, the more digging there was to do. Uh, excavation was a work of Sisyphus on a scale such as engineers had never before faced. Um, so kind of the more digging there was, the more landslides were produced, the more land dumped into the cut, and the more digging there needed to be done. Um, reflecting on this situation, uh, kind of in retrospect, uh, 1936, Carl von Terzaghi, said that the catastrophic descent of the slopes in the deepest cuts on the Panama Canal issued a warning that we were overstepping the limits of our ability to predict the consequences of our actions. Um, so engineering, like logistics, kind of a positivistic discipline, um, was, was kind of bumping up against uh, the, the limits of its capacity to predict um, the consequences of its own actions. Um, I think something very similar can be seen uh, within the shockwave, the engineering shockwave that issues from the Panama Canal expansion. Um, so the, one of those two competitors to the Panama Canal that I mentioned before is the U.S. intermodal system, um, which conveys goods from Pacific ports um, to the Midwest and even to the East Coast. Um, and of course, although the Panama Canal is very excited about the idea of regaining a share of global commerce, um, from its competitors like the intermodal system. The intermodal system is not at all excited about this. Um, so it's engaging in its own kind of program of what I would call counter expansion, um, which on the west coast takes the form, not so much of um, harbor deepening, because the harbors there are already very deep, um, but uh, the upgrading of intermodal infrastructure, both hard and soft, which has served as the primary bottleneck um, for the transmission of goods from the west coast into the rest of the United States. Um, so with all this expansion happening, happening in Panama, happening on the Atlantic coast, happening on the Gulf coast, happening on the Pacific coast, um, th there's a sense that, that this is all kind of part of a zero sum game. That as William Anker says here, everybody is trying to go after it, but there are going to be few beneficiaries, um, or as Kim Severson says, no one really knows how much traffic will be diverted and whether the expected increase will make up for the costs of improving the ports. In other words, some portion of the shock wave is actually an excess. It's a kind of perverse response to misinlined incentives where everyone thinks they're going to be the winner in this game. Um, and logistics as a discipline um, seems to be unable to unravel this indeterminacy, unable to determine who the winners and losers should be. Um, so Robert Petrowski um, from the Army Corps of Engineers wrote reflecting on these conditions, that the pace and scope of these changes is accelerating and expanding in unpredictable ways. Um, and actually the document that comes from uses the word unpredictable something like 28 times in 50 pages um, to describe uh, the consequences of the expansion. Um, so I think this is where uh, design really has an opportunity, where positive, uh, where kind of positivistic, positivistic disciplines and governance fail. Um, there's an opportunity for large-scale design as a methodology that does not depend um, solely on claims to efficiency or absence of bias, um, but instead puts forward kind of um, visions of what might be. Um, thank you. <laughs>